Welcome to Experimental, the science show that makes budgies glow, walks on water and gets itself arrested. Later on, we'll be finding out why this man has spent his life trying to record a duck's echo. That's complete twaddle. Recreating one of the greatest moments in science history... Mary had a little lamb. ..and having a drink with this couple in Boston and Taiwan. But first, let's fluoresce. <laughs> Experimental is in Brisbane, Australia, in search of budgies that glow, and the scientist who's trying to find out why by smearing them in sunblock. But first, we're off to the disco. The ultraviolet lights are blazing, and anyone who really wants to get noticed strutting their stuff has washed their clothes in biological washing powder. And a UV light, they're blinding. Of course, it doesn't necessarily make you any more attractive. So much easier being a budgie. They don't even have to dance to find a mate. They just sit there and glow. All right, can you get that one, Tom? Neurobiologist Justin Marshall of the University of Queensland has discovered that budgies use the natural fluorescence of their feathers to find a mate. And now he's caught some, he's going to prove it by smearing one with sunblock. Fluorescence appears when a material absorbs ultraviolet light and emits visible light. Detergent manufacturers use the trick to make clothes look brilliantly clean. They add fluorescent brightness to soap powder that absorbs UV light and emits blue light, making old, yellowing clothes shine again. In the disco, under intense UV lights, those clothes glow extremely brightly. Luckily for budgies, they don't have to wash their clothes to get noticed. Birds are remarkably well equipped to see fluorescence under normal conditions. Their eyes are sensitive to ultraviolet. They have a much wider visual range than humans and they can see colours around them that we can't even imagine. The fluorescence of their feathers is only visible to us under special ultraviolet lights, but to budgies, it's visible all the time. Scientists have known for some time that budgies fluoresce, but they didn't know why. The real clue as to um, what the fluorescence in the bird was for uh, came from looking at, at where the fluorescence was on the bird. Um, and we noticed that the fluorescent feathers were in parts that the birds were showing to each other. If the birds were displaying to each other, then the chances were it had something to do with sex and mate selection. Animals that fluoresce are slightly unusual um, in that there are, there are many animals that are colourful. Um, fluorescent animals want to be extra colourful uh, and extra gorgeous, if you like, towards their, their mates. So fluorescence, we believe, is something to do with sexual communication. Experiment time, then. Is a glowing budgie more attractive to the opposite sex? Take one female budgie willing to be impressed by a couple of pretty boys. She is placed in a choice chamber, a highly desirable bachelor girl pad equipped with transparent walls through which she can ogle the guys. Take two near identical male budgies, each with fluorescent yellow plumage on their cheeks and crowns. One male is left as he is, the other is smeared with sunblock so that the female can't see him glow. Putting sunblock on the budgies is no problem. They preen it off within a couple of days. And in fact, we have to replace it all the time. So it doesn't harm the birds at all. Uh, all it does is to dampen out that fluorescence in the feathers. If fluorescence is important, then the female budgie should prefer to sit opposite the brightest male, rather than hang out with the sunblock bird. And she does. Budgies choose fluorescing partners much more frequently, significantly more frequently than non-fluorescing partners. 
and this indicates that it is something to do with sexual communication. Hang on a second, though. Maybe it's got nothing to do with sex. Maybe budgies just like hanging out with other bright birds. The females didn't really care whether their next-door neighbour females were fluorescent or not, and males didn't really care about other males fluorescing or not. They only really cared when it was the opposite sex. So males had to have fluorescent females to sit with, and females had to have fluorescent males to sit with. So why does being brighter make you a better mate? Fluorescence might be quite hard to do. It may be quite a hard signal to make. So it indicates that the bird is trying hard um, and being successful in life. So if you're a bright fluorescent bird, you're successful, you're getting a lot of food, you're a worthy mate. Here's a warning. A glowing budgie is a strong, virile, attractive budgie that's irresistible to the opposite sex. The same doesn't necessarily apply to humans. In a moment on Experimental, we'll be arrested using the latest technology. But before we go behind bars, let's walk on water with the test department. James and Anu are having one of those days in the test department. They've got the white coats, but they've got nothing to test. Which is why they're desperately looking through scientific papers for some inspiration. Things are not looking good until suddenly James finds a real gem. Ha ha! A Leonardo da Vinci drawing of shoes that enable man to walk on water. I say, what a great idea. But can this be done? There's only one way to find out. Head to the pool and don some shoes. Predictable. What we need is shoes that exploit the Archimedes principle. Ah, that's the one they name after me. It say to James, he can walk on the water. If he can find a way to make himself weigh less than the water, he's going to push out of the path. Given that James weighs 72 kilos, he's going to need a pair of shoes that will displace more than 72 kilos of water. Let's see how these do. Oh, splashy, but not quite big enough. Now we're talking, how about these? Fantastic. <laughs> but perhaps this experiment explains why Leonardo's walking on water idea never really caught on. Coming up on Experimental, we risk our fingers in an attempt to track down that rarest of things, a duck's echo. We'll be drinking from the cup of love and visiting the test department's recording studio. But before we do all that, let's go in search of a gadget that James Bond would have killed for. Every now and again, the test department takes things a little too far, like blowing up balloons or attempting to smell the armpits of Chinese women. But on a recent trip to Dorset in the southeast of England, things got a bit out of hand. It all started when their latest blind driving experiment went wrong in a fairly spectacular way. One siren and a policeman later, science lost two great minds to the long arm of the law. Right, well, I've had a report of somebody acting very suspicious here. Now, what I'm going to need to do is to fill out a form to search your car. Still mustn't grumble. As a result, Experimental stumbled on a pretty nifty piece of kit. A pen straight out of James Bond. This revved up biro not only writes on the paper, but at almost the same time, it's uploading Mr. Plod Squiggles to the main computer back at the station. So, as the cuffs snap shut on our two former test department demonstrators, their charge sheet is already being prepared down at the plod shop. It's the brainchild of Petter Ericsson. 
what we're aiming for really here is an extension of that technology. We want to keep all that's good about pen and paper and just make it a little bit better in the sense that it also captures what you're writing or drawing and moves it into the digital world. It works like this. Next to an ordinary nib, there is a tiny digital camera capable of capturing over 100 frames per second. But the camera is not interested in the plod squiggles. It's filming tiny dots on the paper and working out where the nib is in relation to them. It's that data that's sent to a microprocessor, then transmitted back to the station, where another computer takes the data and, using the dots, not only recreates the plod squiggle, but manages to put that information onto the correct form. As a result, there is no time wasted in getting our test department testers locked up where they belong. This gizmo isn't only helping out the law, it can also be used as an instant translation device. Simply write in your own language, Swedish Petter being cocky chooses English, and then with a simple tap, it will transmit the data to your mobile phone, which will then read out what you've written in the language of your choice, German or... Now Japanese. You can also be all romantic, sending love squiggles to your lover's mobile anywhere in the world. All that wonderful technology our hapless testers will never get to play with. Don't try this at home! In a moment, we search out the mystery of a duck's echo and go drinking around the world. But first, let's make history with the test department. They're into self-sufficiency in the test department. They might have access to some pretty sexy hi-fi, but when it comes to recording music, they like to do it themselves. What Horace and Heidi are wondering is, can they make a talking machine, the original recording device, out of some old drain pipe and a bit of aluminium foil. Of course they can. They've got white coats. All they have to do is bodge the pipe so it can rotate on this spool thing. Cover it with silver foil, attach a needle to a speaker cone affair and prepare to shout into it. And because we have a sense of history, they're going to say the same words uttered by Thomas Edison when he invented what he called the phonograph. Mary had a little lamb, her fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, her lamb was sure to go. This primitive phonograph works because sound, including nursery rhymes, vibrate as they travel through the air. When the rhyme hits the speaker, it vibrates, vibrating the needle and scratching a ziggy line on the tin foil. You reset the whole thing, the needle vibrates in the groove, babbling the speaker, and you hear pretty much what you've just recorded. <laughs> so let's listen back. Mmm, speech, but not exactly high fidelity. Still to come on experimental internet drinking. So much better than the chat room and the test department's attempt to make rubber eggs. Hello! But first, our sound recordist, Bruce, has a strange obsession with ducks. It's not their swimming or waddling that he likes. No, being a sound recordist, it's their quacks that get him going. Or rather, it's trying to record a duck's echo. Yeah, I've been hunting the duck for quite some time now, and uh, I still can't find the echo of the duck. It's, it, it doesn't exist, I'm sure. Now, this may be news for you, but Bruce is not alone. It's a commonly held belief that a duck's quack does not echo. Don't believe us? Well, let's ask a few farming types. The duck's call is the only one that doesn't echo. No, I don't think you can hear a duck's echo. A duck's quack definitely doesn't echo. Well, those testimonials might do for some people, but not for experimental. 
So we headed to the labs of Trevor Cox, Professor of Acoustics at the University of Salford, to ask him his opinion about non-echoing ducks. That's complete twaddle. Twaddle it might be, but his department was aware of the claims. We only became aware of when we got contacted by people asking us, was this true or was it not true? And of course, when people contacted, we said, of course the crack will echo, go away. However, just because Professor Cox thought that the duck echo claims were twaddle, science can only back him up if there is true experimental evidence to prove it. So we headed off to a local farm to procure him a duck. They didn't have a duck dog, so they lent us their sheep dog, which was next to useless. But Trevor did eventually get his quacker, and we could get down to the serious business of examining its echo. But first, what do you need for an echo? Number one, a good sound source. Bagpipe should do it, then a good hard surface at least 17 metres away, like those cliffs. The melodious sound uh, from the bagpipes leaves our player at approximately 1,225 kilometres per hour. Oh, lovely. It then hits the cliff and bounces back to the player approximately 0.1 of a second later, reducing their melody to a total cacophony. To examine the duck echo, or lack of it, we're first going to record it in an anechoic chamber, a room full of super soft cones, which means there is no chance of an echo. See? We'll then cross-reference this with recordings taken in here. This is a reverberation room where sound echoes around as sound echoes in a cathedral. If a duck's quack's gonna echo, it's gonna echo in here. So, let's start with our reference quack. Come on, Daisy, quack. Come on. Well done, Daisy. <laughs> now, for a truly epoch-making moment. Proof, or otherwise, that ducks quacks echo. Silence, please. Come on, Daisy. Let me come. Let me come. Oh! Let me come. Hmm. Sadly, it took some time before Daisy was prepared to reveal all to science. And who can blame her? This one has been keeping us humans guessing for centuries. But, with a stiff drink for fortitude, she was finally ready to quack. So, do our ears deceive us? Was that an echo or not? Well, you can see here, this is what the waveforms looks like for a duck in a, an environment with no reflections, an anechoic chamber. And here's what it sounds like. <coughs> so, it sounds a bit like a duck. I suppose it's not very surprising. And these are the results if we take it into a big room, the reverberation chamber, where everything echoes around. <coughs> you can clearly hear all the echoes happening. So this is pretty strong evidence that a duck's quack does indeed echo if you're in the right conditions. So why then did the myth about the non-echo ability of a duck's quack arise? Here, sadly, we're back on speculative grounds. Well, there's a few sort of ideas, one of which is that when you hear a duck quack, it kind of sometimes says quack, quack, quack. So maybe the repeated quacking of a duck kind of masks the sound of the echoes coming in. The other possibility is ducks don't tend to be near large surfaces, which can give you reflections. You don't tend to go and hear ducks near large cliffs, which is, if you think about the conditions where you hear echoes, it's up on mountain sides near big, big cliffs, or it's in urban streets where you've got very large walls, and you don't tend to meet ducks in those conditions. So it might just be there's no reflecting surfaces around where people are normally listening to ducks. So Bruce's long search to record the echo that isn't there looks like it's over. It's a, it's a dead duck, as far as I'm concerned. Still to come on Experimental, how high-tech lonely hearts get together. But before that, let's head to the test department for some eggs. There's only so many interesting things you can do with eggs once you've poached them, fried them, boiled them and scrambled them. Your options are 
were limited. But fear not. The test department has an extraordinary experiment that will leave you eggs. Do I really have to read this? Get on with it. Right, um, anyway. Here's how to get an egg in a bottle without breaking it. I said without breaking it. First, take a bowl of eggs. And to check that they're not cooked, break one onto a suitable surface. Next, pour a bottle of vinegar into a bowl and then put an egg into it. That should do it. Now all you have to do is wait around 48 hours whilst the vinegar does its magic. The acid in the vinegar soon dissolves the shell, which is made mainly of calcium carbonate. What's left is the membrane that surrounds the white and yolk, which makes the egg feel more like a rubber ball. But just how rubbery is it? Now for the fun bit. Light a couple of matches and chuck them in a bottle. Then sit the naked egg on the neck and as if by magic, once the match has burnt, the pressure inside the bottle drops and the egg is pushed into the bottle. Bingo! There you have it. An egg in a bottle. Now for the burning question. What do you do with an egg in a bottle? Well, to prove it wasn't cooked, you smash it up, pour it into a pan and eat it, of course. And finally, drinking with a difference. Spring on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And suddenly, all the students are putting down their books and rediscovering their bodies, or more correctly, someone else's body. Yes, love is in the air once more. But there's always the hapless foreign student drinking alone, far away from his loved one. Or is he? Well, no, this is Jackie Lee, and he's on a high-tech date of his own making. And he's not drinking alone. Thousands of miles away in Taiwan, his girlfriend, Han, is staring lovingly into her glass as they drink in virtual reality land. Jackie is a student at the MIT's Media Labs, where they think of kinky new ways to make the mundane interesting. So, uh, the Lover's Cup, there are, like, interface for uh, drinking as a new communication. We don't have to call or email somebody. We can have more impressive ways, like using, uh, using cups as a, as a communication interface. This humble little glass could be the mobile phone of the future. It's embedded with sensors and has a radio transmitter in its base. Like all lovers, it comes in pairs. And once the two cups set up a relationship, they're capable of interacting with each other right across the world. If you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but your lover's in Taiwan, you can still drink together. She takes a drink and your glass lights up. Your lips touch the rim of your glass and thousands of miles away, her glass glows with your caress. Shake your cup and hers vibrates. Which perhaps might lead her to think of other things. The lights and sensors have been around for years. What's new is the fact that the cups are connected to the wireless internet, each with their own individual IP address, which means that signals can bounce across space and find their partner wherever they are in the world. There's only one thing that Jackie has left out, perhaps deliberately. There's nothing to indicate how drunk you're getting. So as you pass out... ..your lover can sip a lemonade in blissful ignorance. <laughs> <laughs>